Well, it's my pleasure once again to introduce uh, Tony Avent. I think I've introduced Tony to more presentations than, than anybody else since I've been doing this. But that's because he, he uh, is so good at it and uh, he draws such a large crowd and he enters for his time. And so uh, you're, you're very much in danger of learning something tonight and laughing. And so, uh, uh, Tony, of course, everyone pretty much knows, but I will I'll give a little bit of uh, information about him. He is the owner of Plant Delights uh, Nursery, and uh, also is well-known uh, Juniper Level Botanical Gardens. Uh, sells about uh, 1,600 plants at uh, Plant Delights, but that's only maybe 10% uh, of uh, what he actually has in, in the gardens. He's a very well-known uh, plant collector um, from all over the world. He's been places like Argentina, China, Mexico, South Africa, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Texas. And, uh, <laughs> that, that worked the last time. Uh, and uh, he's done uh, about 43 collection trips over the southeast and, and five in Texas. Um, so he's done a lot of collection. He has a lot of uh, good information to present. Tonight, uh, the title is uh, Driving Mrs. Granunculus Plant Exploration in Crete. Right. We're wired tonight. Hopefully that does the trick. Let's see, so what are y'all missing tonight? The NCAA tournament, American Idol? Uh, wow, I really didn't expect to see anybody here tonight, but I do appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, it's always fun to share these travel logs and let you uh, plant collect vicariously through our trips. So why don't we go ahead and cut the lights out and I'll, uh, again, as we talk a lot of times, a lot of people look at where plants are going to come from that are going to be good climate matches or good matches for our area. We often try to look at what is the weather like, what is the climate like in the area we're going to. And as I've always tried to tell people, that is not always a good indicator of how well the plant's going to do. And the trip to Crete is a classic example. Crete is a Mediterranean climate. For those that don't know, let me back up. Crete. Crete is a part of Greece. It's a little <laughs> island off the south of Greece. It's 161 miles from tip to tip. Mediterranean climate, which means baking hot during the summer, it's top two rainfall months. It's only two rainfall months are December and January. That's it. This year when we arrived, they told us it was the driest year. They had on record, they had between one and a half to two inches of rain for the year. That is dry. The idea that anything from there would grow here is just absolutely bizarre. So if you looked at it by climate, if you get real scientific and you're in there, like some of the early plant explorers, they would overlay rainfall maps and rainfall patterns, you're going to miss a heck of a lot of cool plants. So we were, uh, our, our dates of travel, April 4th through the 11th of uh, not quite a year ago. There's an example, this is the island. Uh, you've got two main cities, Heraklion with the main airport and Chania with the little bitty airport. Uh, we opted to go to the little bitty airport because we, I had heard of, uh, before that Heraklion could be a little busy, so we said we'll go this small one. Three basic mountain ranges. Right here, left Ori, which has the famous Samara Gorge, which is supposed to be the biggest gorge in all of uh, Europe. In the middle, uh, Salarides, or Mount Ida. And then over on the left is Mount Dicti. So those are your three high areas. Obviously, it goes from very low elevation to uh, about 8,000 feet at the top of the mountain. So we did fly in, we flew into Athens, and then got a uh, plane down. Our uh, travel companions for the trip, we limited this to two people. This is Tom Mitchell. I don't know if any of you have met Tom. Very interesting guy. Tom is from England, and he is starting a mail order nursery. Uh, Tom made all his money as an investment banker with J.P. Morgan Chase and decided he wanted to find some way where he could lose all that money that he made. And he was well on his way. I don't think 
if he really wants to start a nursery, he wants to pretend like he does and go out plant collecting all over the world and then not have to deal with the business stuff. So it's really a nice model if you can uh, afford it. Uh, the way we sort of got Tom into this is obviously now to bring any plants back, you have to have a phytosanitary certificate. And frankly, Greece is not really set up to do phytos, to bring plants back. So I made a deal with Tom, since now the EU is all one big happy family, if he would fly all his plants to England and get them phyto and then send them to us, we would invite him on the trip. So <laughs> it works out absolutely wonderful. And then Alan Galloway, who many of you know, I don't know if Alan made it tonight. Uh, Alan and I have traveled together before. Uh, obviously, he works here at NC State. And uh, Alan had been to Crete about five years earlier. And Alan's a big aeroid guy, so he is... Uh, was really into collecting more dracunculus. That's sort of the plant of our trip. Now, the last time Alan had been, uh, several years ago, he found them all in bloom at the end of April. Well, with my schedule, I only had a small window to go, and that was the early April. So we really were not expecting to find anything in bloom, but uh, uh, our luck was a little better than we had planned on. Uh, we ran the car, picked it up in, uh, in Chania, now, the towns there are just like these Chinese towns. They can't spell them one way. That would be too simple. So the town we're in, Chania, is spelled Chania, Hania, Zania, and Zinnia. So reading the maps is a bear. So we, we picked up our wonderful little van. I just love mini vans for plant exploration. They're great. And off we go into the little town of Chania. Charming, charming European town. Absolutely. I mean, just like you see out of the pictures. All the streets are one-way streets. They're narrow as hell. There's just way too much traffic for the streets. There's no place to park. Uh, if you get off the main street, the little restaurants there are absolutely fabulous. So we reserved a little hotel online, which is always tricky. Uh, got a, what's called a boutique hotel. Now, I didn't know what the heck a boutique hotel was. I found out that means it has less than 10 rooms. Uh, so we got this little, little family that owned the hotel, you know, his mom and pop and the son, and really a marvelous place. I just could not find anything nicer uh, to stay. It's just wonderful. And obviously a, a very charming little area. I did not like how they treat their trees. <laughs> <laughs> At least they weren't great myrtles. <laughs> But man alive, it's just like, you know, you've been doing this this long, you would think after you've killed all these trees that you could learn to do a little better, but, but there we go. Arrived at our hotel, unpacked about three, and then we had daylight left, so off we go uh, into the mountains. So let me back up to my map here. And, all right, here we are at Chania, and our first day we're coming down that little yellow, let's see, I'm going to see if I can use this. There we go. Coming down here into the top of the Samara Gorge. Now, Tourist season starts the 1st of May in Crete, which means there is nobody there in April. Zero. There's virtually no hotels open, there's virtually no restaurants open, but it's great for botanizers because there's nobody there. So the Samara Gorge was actually not open. Now, how do you close a gorge? <laughs> I don't know. But everywhere we went, we're told Samara Gorge not open. Okay, that's fine. So we came from the top and looked in. Uh, from the top. So our first couple of days, here we are just right in this area right here. So. As we're heading up the mountains, first thing we're running to is olive groves. If you like olives, this is like heaven because <laughs> olives are everywhere. So this is pretty low elevation. We're still, we're still very tropical. Our first stop was at the great height of 500 feet elevation and we're already finding plants that we can grow, which was absolutely fascinating. So here we are with Arbutus anita, which we've had, we've got a big one at the house, been growing that for years, marvelous plant. Now, I don't know why more people don't grow this. It's beautiful, uh, just peeling brown bark. It has beautiful white flowers, red fruit, it's evergreen, it's a small tree, large shrub, just incredible, and yet you never see it. Well, here it is in the wild. We're going right beside it. Lavender stoagus. We call it Spanish lavender. There is Cretan lavender. But we grow that. So we're already at 500 feet elevation in an area where we're growing all the plants. Uh, Cystus parviflorus, the best cystus for this area. I've got clumps that are 12 to 15 years old. Fabulous. So we're already, again, 500 feet, and we're able to grow everything we're seeing. That is a very good sign. I love that. 
Even a wonderful white form, not the right time for cuttings or we would have tried to uh, get this one back. The really neat plant, which I had not grown right beside all this, was the Urginia. This is a, uh, it's called sea squill. Fascinating plant. It looks like a eucomus on steroids. <laughs> Amazing. And these were everywhere. It didn't matter what elevation you were at. They were 500 feet. They were at 4,500 feet. They were everywhere and just, I bet we saw 2 million if we saw a single one. Unbelievable. There's the bulb. Oh, I mean, absolutely incredible. And the bulbs are halfway out of the ground. It's just the most amazing thing to be able to survive. I mean, that's a serious water storage device there. But <laughs> unbelievable. We were able to bring a couple back. They overwintered beautifully. They flowered last summer. It's just really exciting to uh, evolve. Uh, second stop, we've gone up another 1,000 feet. We're now at 1,500 feet. Here we are, Euphorbia Caracas. We can grow that. Great plant. So to see these things that, that you just, everything around you, you already grow. It's just, just truly an amazing sight. As we went further into this little alcove, what did we find? One of our U.S. native ferns. Hmm. This is, for those that recognize it, bracken fern, Peridium aquilinum. Ferns are amazing because the spores are so small, one little current carries them all over the world. So you find the very same species, exactly what they grow here, growing over on the, the island off the European continent. Now it's fascinating how plants have evolved on Crete. Because Crete separated about five million years ago. So you've got two different types of plants. You've got the plants that already existed when it divorced <laughs> from Crete, and then you've got the plants that evolved once it got there. So some plants look identical to what's on the mainland, and some are totally specific to the island. So it's really neat, the two different uh, <coughs> types of flora. As we went further in, I was there for ferns. I love ferns. Uh, it's just fascinating to me, and, and almost none of the ferns of Crete are in the U.S., except our natives. This is a plant called Anagramma uh, leptophyllum. Little small fern, only about two inches tall. Cute as could be. And we did get scores from this. They are up and looking fabulous. Uh, growing there in a little rock crack. Selaginella. This is Selaginella denticulata. Uh, this unfortunately did not uh, make it back alive. It's tough to transport Selaginella, so I'm going to have to go back and get this. Very, very cute. And guess what? English <laughs> ivy in the wild. All right. Is that, we know we can grow that one pretty well. <laughs> here it is. All these plants I'm showing you are growing within a five-foot area. All these right in here. This is really amazing to see. And a plant we were after, one of the aeroids. This is an aerocera. This is, this is what you get when you mix an aerocema with an aero. You get an aerocera. There's three species. We've grown these for years. But to see them in the wild, it's so cool. They're only uh, probably four inches tall. Absolutely gorgeous little things. And here they are. Again, we haven't moved. We're in that same five-foot uh, place. And this is the foliage for the Aracerum back here. Uh, God, a lot of little sedums. I don't even know what sedums these are. And again, they didn't transport well. Because when you, when you bear root a little sedum, it's not pretty. Uh, not for a long trip. So. Didn't quite make it back with that. And cyclamen. <coughs> cyclamen. This is the rare, supposedly, cyclamen critic. I've heard for years how rare this is. Blah, blah, blah. Rare? Hell. <laughs> if I saw 50 million of these, I saw one. I mean, I, I have never seen something. You could not walk without stepping on. Here's like 12 every foot. I mean, I've got big feet. But then we just, I mean, it's just incredible. The, the cyclamen were just, just all over the place. And in full bloom. Absolutely could not have picked a, a better time to go. Just just incredible. So here we are now at our next stop up. We're now going up another 1,000 feet. So we're at uh, 2,500 feet. And this is just the landscape. What do we see? Flonus fruticosa. <laughs> we can grow that. There's some more of the squills. Uh, just, uh, there's the euphorbia. And it's just amazing. Again, here we are with a couple inches of rain a year, and yet everything that will tolerate our summers. It makes absolutely no sense at all. A plant I was so thrilled to see, because this is a plant that is totally mislabeled in the trade. This is the real Acanthus spinosus. This is not what anybody sells. Nobody in the country sells the right thing. The right thing is spiny. That's why they called it spinosus. This stuff in the trade hadn't got a decent spine on it if it wanted to. I mean, that thing, that's just nothing but spine. So here it is in the wild. Makes these 
absolutely gorgeous clump, a bear to dig. Good <laughs> gracious, he said. Man, that stuff is rough. So, but to see that was just just amazing. This is uh, Daphne, Daphne Orioides, growing in beautiful two foot tall clumps, just finishing up in flower. This definitely, I mean, again, everything around it we grow. This one should be absolutely fabulous in this area. And finally, we found it on our first day, Dracuncula. Wonderful. Just looking to see the variation. Obviously here, not in flower, but there it is. They vary tremendously in the amount of white speckling on the leaves. This is a really neat flumbus. I wish I could have got cuttings to survive with new foliage, which is yellow at the tail. So very, very nice uh, uh, form. There it is in full bloom. Yeah, just like you would see in your garden here. Also, at the same spot, here is another cyclamen species. This is cyclamen graecum. So we've got two cyclamens growing side by side, all underneath the flumus. Just, just again, it, so amazing to have grown all these plants, and here they are uh, growing right together. I love this. This is a uh, severely tortured Quercus island. This is the holly oak which grows very well here. There's no telling how old that is. Now, all these areas are heavily grazed by goats. So anything that survives in Crete has to survive goats being eaten. But what an amazing uh, testimony to the durability of plants. Just, just incredible. The whole ground among the cyclamens are covered with ground work. Unbelievable. And to my knowledge, these do not exist in the U.S. And every one of these should be growable. This is Orphus heldrichii. And these are probably six inches tall. And just litter the ground by the thousands. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it, and this is dry, bay, full sun, horrible. Not where you think of orchids growing. You just have to totally rethink your whole orchid. It's one of the uh, little orchids. I mean, they're just everywhere. Just, just truly amazing to think that you're crumbling all over the orchids and yet can't build them back. Our next stop is up at 3,000 feet. And this is just backing away a little bit. This is what the area looks like. So even though it's rich, if you're driving by at 55, you're just like, oh, there's nothing out there. But once you get out and start looking around, just incredible. Here was a, a wonderful uh, euphorb uh, caracas with the more of a, almost a pinky as it began to fade. We got seed of a couple of these forms that we're going to attract. Here's a little short one. This one's like one foot tall. Just a, just a dazzling little form. And again, not the time for cuttings, unfortunately, because I would have loved to have uh, brought a lot of cuttings back. And we were just a hair early for seed. Now, we were back. Uh, we went okay from here back to the hotel, because we had completely run out of daylight. Because again, we started at 3. so. Uh, back to our hotel, wonderful dinner. If you ever get to China, it's a it's it sits right on the coast. So dinner, every restaurant, it's like the inner harbor of Baltimore or the South African waterfront. All the restaurants line the city, and in China, everybody it's just like thousands of people head to the restaurants at night. Everyone is absolutely exquisite. The food is I've not eaten anywhere in the world like the food in Crete. It, it's just it's just off the charts good. If you like oregano spices and, and flavoring like that, incredible. So the next day, all through back again, pretty much the same area except going further. So this is our first stop the next day, and this is a ceterac. This is a fern you see mostly uh, European. It's a ceterac officinera. And we did come back with some of this, and so far it's looking good, about two inches tall. Uh, one of those little sun rock ferns that we like so much. And what did we find the second day? Southern lady fern, Ethereum <laughs> Felix Femina, our North Carolina native. Here it is, growing in Crete. Again, absolutely fabulous. So that's two of our North Carolina native species we found overseas. And this is the foliage of that Ericerum I showed you earlier. This is a clump that's a couple flowers outside the photo, but that's the foliage. It looks very much like an Arab, except sort of round. It's a really neat little plant. This is a uh, um, a thyme, not a thyme, a uh, tukarin. Sorry, thank you. A very seriously goat-eaten tukarin. <laughs> uh, we did get cuttings, but unfortunately, they did not survive. I think this would be very neat, a little shrubby tukarin. 
Uh, this is a salvia. This is a purple flowered salvia called palmifera. I've got to get this back. It looks just like a flonus, but with purple flowers. Oh, gorgeous, gorgeous thing. Uh, unfortunately, again, we got a little plant that didn't survive the trip back. Oh, cute little verbascum. Uh, you know, first time I've ever seen those in the wild. I don't know the species. Very uh, nice uh, wavy leaves. And this was a variegated acanthus spinosus. The tips, it didn't show up good. The tips are all variegated white. Uh, again, we did bring root cuttings back, and unfortunately that one did not survive. But I got a GPS reading. I know where that sucker is. <laughs> <laughs> Going back. Now, the interesting thing in Crete, there is a lot of foliar mimicry going on. The plant that develops, it says, okay, I didn't get eaten by goats. So all the other plants are looking like he didn't get eaten by goats. So we're going to change our appearance to look exactly like him. So that's the acanthus. That's not. That's in a totally different family. Not just different genus, totally different family. And yet, it looks for all the work. We found, we got to the point where we would see something, we'd have to actually stop and get down and look real close because from three feet away, it looked just like an acanthus and totally wrong family. There's another one. See, that's not an acanthus flower. Well, this is a Galocytes. This is actually an annual, but it's one killer annual for people who like seriously spiny plants. But again, every all it was there was three species, three genera that looked absolutely identical. It was amazing. So here we are, continuing now. We're up uh, about 4,000 feet, 3,500, 4,000. Now this is just what the cliffs look like as you stop. Uh, stop some incredible. Uh, uh, Dracunculus here. We started noticing better stem patterns. We really not noticed the stem patterns before, but just uh, amazing diversity in those. Look at that one up close. Oh my goodness. Uh, it is scary. Yes, I mean that's just <laughs> amazing for many reasons. But uh, yeah. And here, this is how they're growing out in the wild. This is just you see one here, just out in this heart. See, I've always grown these as sort of a light shade plant. No more. Uh, now, bait. I mean, heck, our sun is nothing like the sun in Crete. Uh, and Aram. So here we are. We, we're, we've got up to a site. This is our first uh, uh, Aram, we think, Alpina, which is a very rare species. The only place we found it was growing underneath these rocks right below the road. Now, uh, Tom was down below the road. I was at the top of the road and found this. This is a little muscari. This is muscari neglectum. Here it is growing in the wild, growing in a rock crack. I mean, just a little pocket of soil, and it's falling in there, and here it is blooming. When I got finished taking a photo of that, I turned around to look to find this. This is one of our goals of the trip. This is peony clusii. Clusis peony, a beautiful thing. Almost non existent in the U.S. There's, there's very, very few people growing this and should be a great one based on where this is from. So we're really excited to, to locate this. Uh, nearby, hanging off the cliffs, is something called an anosma. Anybody grown an anosma? This is a uh, in the borage family. And uh, it didn't have seed, but when I got back, I found a seed source. So we've now ordered three species of anosmas. We're going to see uh, how they do. And we are, we are now near the town of Olamos, Olamos. Omelos, which is a really nice little touristy town. And we were getting hungry because it's about lunch time. We only found one restaurant open in the entire town. So we pull into the parking lot. What did that guy grow in the parking lot? Candy <laughs> Clusii. Oh my God. Planted all around the lunch tables. Oh, it was incredible. Because you never see people using plants from their own native area. Just not done. But here they are. So we got great pictures from the, uh, from the area. So if you're ever in Omelos, this uh, hotel called the, the Near, Near Omelos Hotel. Oh my God, what a best pork chop I've ever eaten in my life. It was just, I can still taste it. It was just beyond incredible. We're the only people at the entire place, because again, hadn't opened for tourist season yet. From here, we drove up to the very top of the Samara Gorge. So this is as far as we could go, the road ends. So we looked around and headed back, because there was really no road. But then we found this little road little gravel road going off to the side. So we like little gravel roads, so <laughs> off we went. <laughs> and along the road here is anemone coronaria. Cute little plant. Look at that, two inches tall. We bought uh, one of these back. It's in full bloom in the garden now. Just absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous colors. 
just a tiny little thing. And orchids, oh, man, this is in this just pure gravel, you know, like feet deep of gravel. This is another of the little orchids, just, just incredible. We got to the point just over 4,000 feet. We were trying to go higher, and the road was gravel. The road was about this wide, and we were on a van with not four-wheel drive. So we got to the point where we were on this road, and all of a sudden, we started spinning and sliding. And that's not a good feeling. Uh, so, so everybody got out. I was driving, and we just very carefully, inch by inch, edged back till we could catch our breath, because I thought for sure we were over the edge there. And, got back to a level area, stopped, and we started to look around this level area. You see these leaves right here, these, right here? Well, we got closer, what did we find? Oh, wow. Arabs. This is actually one of the rarest of the Arabs. This is a natural hybrid between Arum ideum and Arum criticum. It's only been written up once, and that was just a few years ago when it was published, and to my knowledge, that doesn't exist anywhere, and we just stumbled on an entire patch on it. Uh, growing beside that is the true Arum ideum, which also is almost unknown in cultivation, certainly in the U.S., and we were able to uh, secure both of these. And in this area, they were everywhere. I mean, tens of thousands. Uh, so, it was, so, I mean, if they're rare, they certainly aren't rare in this location, or either we just stumbled on a new location. But that was pretty neat. Anybody know what these are? Those are crocus. In the wild, that's what they look like. Aha! Crocus 1, Crocus 2, Crocus 3, Crocus 4. There's probably 30 or 40 crocus in there. Now, most people walking over that would not realize that that was a crocus because they were not in bloom. But that's what these things look like in the wild as opposed to in the garden where we got really nice conditions and they look quite a bit different. But that was so cool that my first opportunity to see those in the wild. What's that other plant next to it? Uh, let's see. With the three leaves. See the stems coming out in this third, like a three leaves at the Right tip? here? No, down at the bottom. That, right here? That thing. No, that's no, no, no. over. Right there, yeah. What is that plant? Oh, that's a uh, clover. It's trifolium. Oh, it is a clover. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah, it looks like it has woody stems. No, no, no. no. That's just something else laying there. Oh, well, there, okay. were, there were several trifoliums in there. We did not uh, bring any of those back, but that one really did look good. pretty colored. Oh, it was very, very cool. So we're, we're, we're heading back down now because, again, we're back to the top as far as we can go. We're driving back. We decided to take a different route back to the hotel. And all of a sudden, our bells go off because we're in a dry area, and we looked out driving down the road. What do we see? Sycamores. Sycamores indicate one thing, water. So hit the brakes, drop off, jump, and incredible areas. We started walking. Not a lot of water at the base. But the further we walked up, the more the, the water got. And just incredible area. This is the cycle of critical. Oh, Tens of thousands. Just in, it's, it's just, un, it's, it's really one of those sites you almost can't speak. It, it's just so overwhelming emotionally. Uh, just, and, and we could not have hit it any better. Every leaf type form imaginable. Here's a silver leaf one. Here's a a speckled leaf, here's a darker leaf with a pattern, there's a purple back leaf, I mean it just was incredible. And arum, so this is arum consonitum, this is one we grow, it's a wonderful air. And we were able to select some different leaf forms, uh, this is the flower on consonitum, and that varied. Uh, this is one without any purple, many of them look like this, and have purple. So we caught them in flowers, so it's so cool, so we're able to get uh, pieces off these and bring back several of these wonderful poems. Just an amazing year. There's the cyclamen with the little erisarum that we saw earlier. Just the combinations were just just so wonderful. And we went up a little further and actually here's Alan is coming back to the hotel just covered in blood. I mean, he, as I say, he looked like an extra from the Texas Chainsaw Master movies. And he had jumped to get something right near this and just busted his leg all the pieces. Oh, and, uh, he said, go, go, go up there, there's primulas. And sure enough, here is primula vulgaris growing with cyclamen. Primula vulgaris likes it wet and moist. Cyclamen like it dry. But here are the two growing side by side, right beside the water. I mean, what, a, what an amazing, I mean, the, 
you know, the photos. I mean, you couldn't have planted it any better than that. Just incredible. We did get this back. This is doing great in our garden now. Uh, there's just a close up. Beautiful soft yellow. And this one obviously should do very well in our climate. This is a little uh, saxophrase, saxophrase rotundifolia that I fell in love with. And unfortunately, that did not survive the trip back. But I want this. This should be fabulous. <laughs> Grew right along the creek, just about six inches tall and absolutely delightful. And this is some of the odd sedums. Again, sedums were everywhere, hanging up on the banks, these wonderful things. And my favorite plant, and a plant I've grown before, this is umbilicus. Has anybody grown umbilicus, umbilicus rupestris? Is it the purple? It's this, yes, this purple leaf funky thing. It's, it's like first cousin to a sedum. But really, wow, that, that's, that's as big as it gets a little short spike of uh, nondescript flowers. But what, a, what an odd plant. And so that was so neat to see that hanging off the uh, rock cliffs. Another muscari uh, getting ready to come into bloom. Uh, and again, ferns. This is a little uh, asplenium. And I don't I think this one survived the trip, so we may have to go back after this. I don't know the species on that, but really cute. And from there, we came back and we're heading back toward the hotel, and we stopped for a patch of arums that we found. Look right beside them, and here is another U.S. native. This is Blechnum spica. This is a West Coast native. This is a California native, and one that we normally cannot grow, but from here, we should be able to grow it. Uh, unfortunately, that one did not survive our trip, and there was no spores. So I've got the GPS reading on that clump, so we can go back in spore season and, and get that. I, I want that very bad. This was my goal of my trip, to find southern maidenhair fern in Crete. And which, again, I'm trying to collect it from every continent. So we knew it was there, and we're coming back, and it's almost dark. We're coming along this curve, and all of a sudden, all three of us yelled at the same time. And we're able to stop, and here is this just incredible patch in a wet seat right by the road. And so we were able to get uh, this back. It's doing absolutely fabulously well. So that was, that's just so neat to have one species that occurs on every continent and then be able to collect it from each and grow them all side by side. And we, it was still dark. We're coming a little further, and we stopped to a screeching halt again for royal fern. This is our native, Osmunda regalis. So we've now been there two days. We found four native species of the United States. That's just incredibly cool. There was only one plant in those forests, so unfortunately could not get that. But the hill here was fascinating. It was covered with Ruscus aculeators, butcher's broom, going right with, with royal fern. That's, that's a combination I did not expect to find. All right, so, so now we're, we've, we've gone back. We were all in here, we've gone back to these areas. So now we're going back here, and our next trip going to be here coming down and we're going to take the road down to here for the next night so we're heading east along the coastal highway we're fairly low low and we hit the most incredible euphorbia i've ever seen an eight to nine foot tall euphorbia in full flower aptly named this is the tree euphorbia euphorbia dendroides a great name uh, we were not able to get seen on this one, so again, we've got to go back, because I can could, I could do a nine-foot euphorbia in my garden. I like that idea. Mm. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> absolutely incredible. The fennel. Unbelievable. Huge balls of bright yellow. Never seen anything like this, and we were able to get a few seeds off this and, uh, and bring this back. I, I've never seen anything. It's, again, two-foot balls of bright yellow. The whole highway for miles was lined with Columbus through the coast. Just, just an amazing, amazing sight. This is the salvia I showed you earlier, salvia palmifera uh, in bloom. Uh, didn't, no way to get seed or cuttings that time of year. But that's one I think we really need to get in. I think that would do very well here. This is a very cool plant. This is a monotypic genus to Crete. The genus occurs nowhere else. There's one and only one. This is Petromarula, Petromarula panata. And the cool thing about it, we grow this. We grow this in our garden. This is first cousin to Campanulus. This was our first winter with it out. Came through the winter already, coming back up. Very exciting, these three-foot spikes of blue. This is cool. 
So we're going to work to get this one now that we know it will come through our winters. Uh, and going right beside it is our first Calanthes of the trim. This is Calanthes across the Croydia. Uh, and we did get one plant of that. That is looking great for us now. So we got that and we'll be able to get spores and get that one uh, uh, in production. Another one of those rock sun ferns. <coughs> I collect asparagus, and I was thrilled to find this one. This is asparagus aphilus variety orientalis. Terrible name. Cool asparagus. Only like three foot tall. The stem was almost an inch around. Thick as can be. Uh, no seed, unfortunately. We're not able to get this one, but, but I know where it is. I'm going back after. And digging in here is hard. Because Crete is nothing but a big rock. And it, it's, I mean, some places you go, you just easy. Man, you can pick all day long, and you just make no headway at all. Colchicum. Oh, my God. Colchicum macropolum, the giant colchicum. Unbelievable. These things, it looks like a hosta. Absolutely amazing, amazing plant. Uh, we did get a small piece of this, came back, and it's looking great. It's already up, but, but digging any size of this, there is no way absolutely <laughs> impossible. From here, we went all the as far as we went to the west, and now we're coming straight down. There's just a steep gorge between the mountains. So here we are, and we're looking for any roads. There's not a lot going up into the mountains. So here we are heading up just as high as we can go, uh, about 4,000 feet, more than 4,000 was as high as we are. So here we are walking. There's Tom and Alan, and look how dry. I mean, it's just insane how dry. But even in that, we can look and, and this, yeah, just the uh, just looking at the rock face. This is a, uh, a new, one of the euphorbias in the area. Beautiful, spiny as hell, but a cute little plant, only about a foot tall. Whether that was by nature or by goats, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but here we are looking under one of the rocks. We found a little rodularia. Cute little suckling. We did get a cutting off this, and it has survived. It's in a pot, so we got to get that out. That's a very cute little one, baby. And more muscari. This is in that area, 4,000 feet, where nothing can grow. And here is another little muscari. So you talk about tough. Man, that's just unbelievable. From here, we headed straight down to our hotel on the coast. And we were running a little late, because that happens when you're botanizing. And we had given them our cell phone. And cell phones now, for those that don't travel, are so cool because you can keep your regular number and people can call you from anywhere in the world and your phone rings. <laughs> so I'm coming down the mountain and the phone rings. And it's like, is this Mr. Avon? I said, yes, who is this? Oh, I'm the manager of the hotel you're coming to. Where are you? Oh, wow, that's cool. I said, well, we're almost into town. We don't know where the hotel is. He said, I'll find you. <laughs> we pulled into the hotel and the dude is standing there right in the middle of the road. Welcome to a hotel room. Or a it, again, no tourists were here. There was like us and two other people in the hotel. So he's out in the street waiting for us. It was just absolutely cool as could be. Delightful little uh, hotel. We checked in, had a little daylight left, so off we went up into the mountains. It was about a 20 mile trek as far as it can go. Ending in the town of, or the little, it's not a town, it's a road sign. Uh, the hotel there called Agionis. Turns out there's like four towns in Crete named Agionis. We botanized around there a little bit. Uh, again, when I say it's a rock, it's a rock. But that rock is just full of draconiculus. It's just amazing. Now, to get there, about one minute before you get to the sign, you cross this bridge. Now, I don't do heights. I just don't do them. I'm mortified of heights. So I'm coming along this road, we're just coming along the curb, and all of a sudden we get the bridge. Now I'm going too fast to stop. So we just go across the bridge, and I'm not really looking. And of course Alan has to say, oh my God, look down. <laughs> <laughs> not good. Not good at all. Make coming back very unpleasant. Well, when I got back, I decided to look for this bridge, because that was one. That, that, I mean, it's, I had to crawl to look when I got to the edge. Turned out that is the second highest bridge in all of Europe. <laughs> Which just absolute to this day I shake when I say that. It was incredible. But once you got back across, 
the road is, the, the highways are full of asphodelene ludium, which I have killed many times. Now, obviously, the Cretan form is different, so uh, we have to go back and get this. I can get this without crossing that bridge again. I will not do that. That, that is just not happening in the life. Uh, that was just... That was just very, very bad. So the bridge. Where, where we? <laughs> the bridge is made out of two by ten. It's not even a real bridge. <laughs> that bridge is right. That's a hotel, and the bridge is right here. Well, where's the picture? Of the bridge? Oh, hell no! I can't hold my hands. <laughs> you never see my hands shaking. It's not pretty. Oh no no no! Oh no! So next day, here we are. We're 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 heading back out. <laughs> All right, come on, pointer. Oh, there we go. We're going to head back out up here, and then we're going to cut across these little dinky roads. All up in here, and then we're going to go down to here, down to here, down to here, and end up down in here. So we're going to do some sort of back roads now. So we've been driving about an hour on these hard roads where they're just covered in rocks, because the rocks fall off, and they haven't swept the roads, which they must do often, and hit this patch of Asphodelus estivus. Unbelievable. We grow this. This is absolutely fabulous here. And here we are in a patch of uh, literally hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, just a truly amazing, amazing sight. That was one clone that just was beyond compare. I did get a piece of that and unfortunately didn't survive the trip. Got a little too wet. But man, what a, what a sight to behold. Just incredible. And there's more of those mimics. Neither one of those are acanthus pinosus, but they both look exactly like it. They're just, just fascinating. We've been going now about three hours, and we're coming around these cliffs, and all of a sudden, Tom yells, Stop! 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 <laughs> okay, I don't know what you saw, but let's go. So we start hiking up, and the only way you can stay on these ledges is goat trails. So that's the only good use of goats, is to make trails. So here we are winding our way up, and before long we could look up ahead and see this. Our first sighting of Arrow Criticum, the yellow arrow. Absolutely amazing. High atop the mountain. Look at it in person. Wow. Yeah, that's just one of those, that's a Horkgasm moment. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know, we just went up and made our homage. And, took pictures and nobody even touched that clump because that was just, uh, it was absolutely perfect. We could not have hit it in better peak. So that's just one of those moments you will think about the rest of your life. So we were able to find a lot more in the area. There's Tom with a big smile on his face and the arrow in his back. Uh, he told me I can't show this, at least not in England. Uh, but coming back down, really neat areas. Now look, let's see if I can use this. Oh, there we are. Ruscus aculeatus. <coughs> and then growing, I don't know if you can see this, right up in here. I walked, I'm coming down, I walked by and I saw the Ruscus and I looked at it and I walked a couple steps back. I was like, okay, that looked like a Mondo grass. There's not any Mondo grass here. And sure enough, Iris ungricularis cretensis, now known as Iris cretensis, one of my target goals for the trip, we had actually found it. Goats have just mowed this stuff off. I mean, it's not tall to begin with, but man, that was so cool to find that. And there were faded flowers. We probably missed flowers by a day, but, but so neat to finally, uh, finally find that one. All right. So here we are. We're going a little further now past the wonderful Aram site. And from here for the next three hours, it was just Arams everywhere. Just the side of the hills were just littered in Arams. Look at this. Everywhere that's yellow is a little arrow. We got into this one site. It was just amazing. Just, it's just like every three or four feet were clumps of arrows. Uh, just truly amazing. And this is one of the many, there are many uh, fabaceous members of the, of the uh, pea family. Uh, this is one. The fragrance was like the strongest honeysuckle imaginable. Unbelievable. Like, I, I've got to get back and get a seat of this. That's uh, Wow, spiny as hell, but man, was it fragrant. And more peony clusii growing right beside the arum criticum. Unbelievable to see that again those two combinations together. There's the close up of the peony. And more orchids. That's more of those dang graham orchids. They're just everywhere. Just, just incredible. 
incredible plants. We had stopped now, come on down out of the mountains. We were at, say, about 2,800. We're down about 1,300 for lunch. I uh, found one lunch place on the side of the road with a, a buffet, actually, which was sort of interesting because it was us and four Greek priests. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Very interesting. And the most interesting thing, actually, above the mantle in here was this giant bomb. <laughs> Now, this just was weird, because the four great priests were eating right under the ball. <laughs> and I, I wish I'd taken a picture of that. I didn't know, you know if they would take kindly to that. But it was just a very amusing photo. And from there, we went right outside, walked down. There was another gorge. This is a gorgeous area. And found this. This, you can't tell it now because the flowers. This is Clematis serosa, another plant we all grow, the winter-blooming Clematis. So that was our... First opportunity to see that in the wild. And underneath that, what is there? More iris, Ungricularis cretensis. But this is a completely different form. The other had short leaves. Even when it wasn't eaten, it had short leaves. Mm -hmm. This, a lower elevation form, has very long leaves up to the foot. And we did get samples of both of this, and it's holding down below, which is really fascinating. This is a plant I did not know. I don't know how well it's going to do because it needs really good drainage, I can assume. From <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is close up. It looks like a cross between a hypericum and a euphorbium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a Leontis. This is Leontis Leontipodium. I have never heard of a Leontis before. Well, I've heard of them. I didn't know what they were, but uh, I've got to see if we can find this. We were not able to find any seed, but that, if I could grow that, that is one seriously cute plant. <laughs> Um, heading on a little further, we stopped, and we stopped because of the lupin. Uh, this is uh, uh, their native lupin, which is incredible, and, and who knows, maybe we could grow that. And ducked into the woods to find just an amazing little area right beside a field. There was only probably 10 foot of area to get in, and just amazing. Found this arum with just insanely huge wow. leaves, biggest leaves I've ever seen on an arum consonitum. We were able to get a piece off that, so we've got that in the garden now. And a clump of the culture of Macropolum. Unbelievable. Four foot across. I can only imagine what that was like in, in bloom. Uh, both Alan and Tom tried to get a piece of this, and every rock in the ground to three foot was that big. And after two hours, they all both gave up. Absolutely exhausted. It's just it's truly impossible. You just cannot, you just can't dig here. It just, just doesn't happen. Uh, coming on back as we uh, come on, this is Gladiolus italicus, a plant that we grow and does absolutely fabulous for us, growing here with the flumus, and we were able to get a, a specimen of that. It's just littering the highways everywhere. <coughs> as we got down to our near the coast, uh, Alan had said several years ago he found some wonderful odd flowering forms of Dracunculus vulgaris. Now we were very, we had not seen anything even in bud the whole trip. Again, he had pretty much written the trip off got down here and all of a sudden we found one in bud. Now we had gone through probably an hour where he had found hundreds of them five years ago. None left. None at all. So we don't know if they had had a Dracunculus eradication program. Uh, maybe, I mean the smell's a little strong or something but they had completely eliminated just massive, massive miles of Dracunculus. They just were not there. And only when we finally got down to the coast did we start seeing just a few. So we're almost out of daylight, and then we finally found one in bloom. And this was a beautiful five-foot-tall specimen that's just incredible. A good offsetting form. We named this one Miss Marble, and we did get uh, offsets of this. So this is growing for us now. So it's taken a few years to get it back up to size. But what an amazing plant, because in the U.S., everything is the, pretty much the red. There's no color variation. At all, and the only place there's color variation in the wild is one small region of creek. That's it. Everywhere else, it's exactly the same. Growing right nearby, again, it's almost dark. I stopped by the road. This is Queen Anne's lace. Okay, which we all love. I love Queen Anne's lace. But it wasn't this one that I was fascinated about. It was this one. Oh. Oh, a pink yes. queen. I, I've never seen that. I thought that. I mean, I know it's an annual. Okay, that is very cool. Um, again, no seed, but I do have the picture to remember it by. <laughs> and then we're ending up, we're back down on, okay, come on, Pointer. Where are you? Hello. 
Okay, we're, we're, we're ending up right here at Matala. Now the next day, we're going to go back up here. We're going to go up here, diddle around in here, around here, through here, up here, up here, and then our next night will be right there. So we're going to go through a different set of mountains the next day. So we'll wake up in the morning. We got there tonight. It was pitch black. Checked into our hotel. Next morning got out. What an incredible, incredible sight. It was just, just absolutely gorgeous. The food we ate, second night in a row, we'd eaten right on the Mediterranean Sea. You could hear the waves breaking on the restaurant. I mean, you talk about seriously fresh seafood. Oh my gosh. Unbelievable. We had like the, the fish special, five fish, which I'd never heard of before. Sword, sword somethings and all kinds of stuff. Oh man. Just, the food was insanely good. And again, we're the only people in the entire restaurant. I just can't tell you enough, April is the time to go to prison. Outside our hotel, I thought this was very cool. Um, I mean, that's what you do with an old dead tree. That's, that's just amazing, the artistic work there. So, uh, Heading on out, we're heading back up, and we're getting excited because we're starting to find some, some more amorphophallus in the bud, and we're getting up higher in elevation, which is always a good thing. So we're up about uh, 1,400 feet. And then we hit a spot about 20, 2200, 2300, and we started seeing really tight buds. Got it, walked along this little creek, and everything is in bud. So we've learned to be able, at a certain point, you can unfurl it and get a pretty good idea of what the color is going to be inside. Not always, but pretty close. An amazing area filled with just verticulous and amazing orchids. Oh, it's just, again, it's just, and these are, you know, into six inches to a foot. All rain. We left there and we headed up and we're driving by this dry rocky cliff and Alan screams, stop, stop, stop the car, stop the car. And we're looking like, what the hell's out there? I don't see much out there. We've got to walk around. What's out there? Draconiculus. Oh, yeah, you talk about some serious digging. Okay, this is just, anybody who thinks Draconiculus need being pampered in the shade, no, 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 get over that. So as we walked around, we started seeing more and more as we got closer and closer with incredible forms ready to bloom, and then sure enough, here they are. Oh, Is that just the most, I mean, that's just another of those, you just stop and fall down, and it's like, oh my goodness. That's just, I mean, that is just beyond anything that I could have ever dreamed. I, I'd seen pictures, but to see that in the wild and, and hit it in peak bloom, I mean, none of us could believe that. Here's different forms. There's a, I mean, just, just amazing. There's white with yellow, every combination of magic. Oh. And growing in this just baking, hot, dry, horrid, rotten hillside, it's just, it's just beyond comprehension. So I've got, got a whole new appreciation for this plant after that trip. What was really neat, growing at the base of the rocks is more southern maidenhair fern. <laughs> oh man, that is just too cool. So we got a couple of different collections. Right above that, Ooh. beautiful clump of Arum consonitum again. Isn't that a great form? Oh man, I just, I mean, I know Arums are sort of weird, not everybody likes them, but I think that is just absolutely elegant to see in the wild. And then hanging right above the maiden here is one of their great natives. Anybody recognize this? Fig. This is the edible fig that we all love. That's a rather big fig. Uh, that could hide a lot of people. But, uh, so neat to, to see it in the wild, just coming out of the uh, rocks where there's obviously a little bit of moisture. From here, coming back, just we make a few stops at, at really interesting forms of uh, euphorbia. This one, beautiful yellow flowers. I did get seed of this, and they are up. We have this. So if it, if it looks that good in person, that I mean in uh, cultivation, that'll be really neat. This was actually a what we think is a hybrid flumus between flumus critica, the small leaf gray, and flumus bruticosum. Both were growing together, and then this form did look perfectly intermediate between the two. And there's Critica, which is a much smaller leaf, and that also grows very well here. Uh, we're heading up, and again, I mentioned we've taken those, some of the side roads, so here's one going up to the top of a mountain. Beautiful, beautiful road. So here we are going up 
Uh, got as high as we could go with our vehicle, which again, no four wheel drive, just about 4,000 feet was it. Parked and began walking down the hill. And again, amazingly rocky area. Amazing number of goats eating plants in the rocky area. But always looking for interesting plants. Here is a waving leaf arum criticum with the yellow flowers. So we'll see if that trait holds uh, in cultivation. And then looking for interesting things, I got looking, I'm standing here by this tree, and all the trees are scrubs, because they've been just gnarled by the climate and the goats. And I'm looking inside, and I see this little strap leaf thing that looks like a fern. And I kept looking at it, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, there's no perosia ferns here. And it just hit me, <laughs> there was a biarum. Now for those that don't know biarum, biarums are half an arum. <laughs> biarums are little bitty, they're just little bitty, it's like a miniature arum. It matures out about an inch and a half, two inches tall. And sure enough, there were biarums growing in there. Now, I did not get a close up because climbing in there, I had to leave the camera because you just have to, it's, it's gnarly, it's spiny, it's just nasty. But we finally were able to get those and, and we do have a couple of biarums back. So uh, maybe one day they'll flower and we'll get some good photos. <laughs> Coming back down, we had to stop again for Alan to get the one <laughs> trachonculus that was taller than he was. This is more than six foot tall. Wow. It's just insane. I mean, here we up against this uh, amazing dry creek bed. Now, he was very excited at uh, that prospect. And then right near that was this wonderful little plant. This is Aristolochia critica which I have not found that was in the U.S. And we actually, I didn't think I got that survived, but it's come back up in the spring. So we do have that cute little bush, only about a foot tall. And it had, I bet, 50 flowers on each plant. Oh, man, was that just, that's just too cool. So thrilled to have that uh, come back. From here, one more journey up into a mountain. This is like a moonscape. This is up over 4,000. It's just desolate. The only thing up there is this, and that is uh, Flomus critica again, a nice alpine form. And again, I wish we'd been there when it was rooting time, because this would be gorgeous. Just a ball of gray would be amazing. And then coming back down the road, uh, more of the uh, close-up of the uh, gladiolus italicus, which we, again, we found a lot of it. This is a little anemone, anemone narcissifolia. Isn't that great? Oh, love that. I've never grown this before. Well, that, that was that was very very cute. All right, so we're we're now almost up to our hotel. It, the day is ending. We're we're sort of running out of daylight, and we had booked these hotels all online. And so we found this place. We couldn't find anywhere up here that was open. And I finally got one place, and it was a spa, some sort of resort and spa. Okay, whatever. The rates weren't bad. And so we got up to this little town, and we're we're, we're going all around. And here's the hotel row. It's not in the hotel row. We stop and ask people don't know. Finally, we got up there. Up there. How do you get up there? You know, and he's going to go here and go here. We drove around for an hour. We could see the ledge. We could not find the damn thing. And finally, it's pitch black. And I mean, and we're, we're just totally lost. And we've got very good maps. Finally, we found some guy. He said, no, no, no. They've taken you the wrong way. You have to go back down here. Go and we went up this little rutted out road, horrible, the worst road we've been on the whole trip. Uh, I mean, just terrible. And we finally arrived at the hotel. <laughs> this five-star resort, which they obviously built right before everything in Greek crashed, and they didn't have the money left to build the road to get there. <laughs> Unbelievable. I've never seen a place like this. I mean, it's just very elegant, Ultra modern. Oh my goodness. Wow. And this, this is on this ledge overlooking the city, overlooking the Mediterranean. We checked in. Now we're, we've been out botanized all day. We are nasty. We walked in the hotel, and the guy at the front desk looks at us. <laughs> <laughs> you are staying here? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, we had to give him all kinds of identification. He said, I will take you to your room. <laughs> Let me show you where the bathroom is. Let me show you where the shower. I've never had anybody do that to me. <laughs> These people are seriously uppity. <laughs> but it is one half of a hotel. Let me tell you, if you ever get a chance, the, the Royal Hall, wow. It's just, it's just uh, I mean, words cannot describe this. Everything in the room is ultra modern European, and there's nobody there. It's just, us in the court, and he didn't like us. 
<laughs> the restaurant was open. It's a wonderful restaurant. Oh my goodness, just just incredible place. So next day we're off up again. Uh, we're heading now further to the east. This will be the creek sort of divided into three regions: the far west, the central, and the east. Now the, the far west where we started is the really dry region of creek. The center part of creek is even drier. <laughs> the east is the driest. Okay, there is no wet. So we're now heading into the super dry, which means everything is really the pauper. So even the amorphophallus were dwarfed. Uh, we got the one area, uh, about 3,000 feet, all the amorphophallus were flowering at one foot tall. It's a totally dwarf strain. It's really freaky. So that's what this uh, actually is. More orchids. Oh my goodness. And again, just growing in these hot rocks. So we're in Mount Dicty now, and it found the south of the border of Crete. <laughs> I love this. This is the Homo Sapiens Museum. Everybody must go there. I found that Peyote Glides told me before I went, said the, the, the real Greeks look down on the Cretans as, as sort of the, they're like the redneck Greeks. And I see why after going here. What a, what a neat place. I mean, the whole, uh, uh, evolution of man from cavemen up to the moon. It's just a wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it's American kids has nothing more to breathe. So you have to go to this if you get to Mount Dick. But <laughs> after we left, again, growing up into the areas, we're up about 4,500 feet. Now, so we're a pretty high elevation area. Uh, amazing areas. This is a little. Uh, uh, convolvulus, uh, uh, which we grow and does very well. Actually, it grows too well. I had to take it out of my rock garden, but a wonderful little dwarf alpine form. We even found the Clematis serosa here at 3,500 feet. It is not known above 2,000 feet. So that could really extend the range of that plant. And this little cool plant, is that just the neatest thing? That's a Medicago orbiculatus. Hell, I've never heard of the genus before either. I just thought that is one seriously cool plant. Oh, it's about an inch tall, an inch maybe two inches tall. Um, did not get seed, but I gotta find this because I just I grow that just because it's so bloody weird. <laughs> okay, you miss it. All right, I'm good. I'm ready to go. And of course, more of the orchids uh, just popping out of the rocks everywhere. What is that? Iris Umbricularis pretensis again. This was just so thick. There was probably 10,000 plants in there if you took them out and divided them. Unbelievable. And they just finished blooming. We missed bloom by probably a week. We found a few scattered flowers. But to see that earlier, oh, and be able to select color forms would just be absolutely incredible. And then coming down, what did we find? Styrax. Styrax officinalis in full bloom in one of the streams as we uh, come back down. So we're uh, pretty much at the end of our trip, heading back, uh, maybe just a couple last stops, stop for lunch. Lunch is always a fascinating thing, because all of these are little mom and pops. And the day before, we stopped in this town and there was nothing open. And we found one guy at a restaurant. He was painting his uh, deck for his picnic area. And we went in and said, you know, you have lunch. Oh, oh yes, no uh, lunch. So he brings us in, again, to the refrigerator. Opens the refrigerator. It's like a 1950s refrigerator. <laughs> what you want? And the food in it has been there since the 50s. <laughs> I mean, it had. Oh, we have rabbit. 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 Rabbit and potatoes. Have you rabbit? Okay, rabbit and potatoes. Obviously, last year's rabbit. <laughs> but within 30 minutes, we were eating rabbit and potatoes. And, uh, in each of these little restaurants, again, not even open yet, but the food on each was just, just absolute one. He even made that old rabbit potatoes uh, taste good. It's amazing what oregano can do for food. <laughs> but they do butcher the plants. Oh, man. I just, I don't know what it is. All the energy and time it must take to do that was just fascinating. Our final stop at Mount Dickey, this is actually a parasitic plant. This is one of the wonderful order banshees. Or, but you can't grow them, but you can photograph them. They just, they're parasitic on roots and just amazing. All this looks like an orchid. Mm -hmm. That is an orchid. That's one of the Seprophila orchids. Oh, my goodness. Oh, 
Oh man, just, just, just again, I've got to find a way to get these orchids. These are just too good. A little geranium tuberosa. We did bring a piece of this back. That's actually done fabulous for us. That's a, a very good, very well adapted species. Oh, Quercus coccifera. Oh man, I've never grown this oak. I need this oak. This is good. <laughs> little dwarf, like eight foot oak with beautiful flowers, red new foliage. I'm loving this. Gotta have this. Anybody know what this is? These are tulips. <laughs> Just finished flowering and going dormant. This is the native tulip. We found, oh man, we find tulips. A very few in bloom. But that is tulip. So we were able to get pieces of this. So hopefully this year, we, I believe this is uh, tulip of Saxatilis. Beautiful thing. And then final stop heading back. The only inland lake in Crete, uh, Lake Kornos, we stopped at and uh, found some more amazing. This is a beautiful air. The petioles are dark purple. This one should be absolutely gorgeous. And then this killer flowness with the white edges around the leaves. Oh, so again, got to go back, get some cuttings of that. But I, I hope this gives you just a little bit of idea of some of the amazing plants. Again, in a climate that really we shouldn't be finding anything that would grow for us. Thank you very much. Thank Glad you. to tackle any questions if anybody has any. Uh, Tony, do you have fog that night? No, no fog at all. It's just it's like too dry for fog. Where you got some Yeah, no, we kept we did not see any when we were there. Now maybe different times of year. Maybe in the winter you might have some, but no, it was seriously dry. <clears throat> yeah. How are these plants going to tolerate our clay soil? Well, it, the key is good drainage, obviously, but a lot of them, I grew when I lived in Raleigh on the plate and never had any problems, so I think they're going to do really well as long as you do a little bit of amending. But let's say it doesn't make any sense in any of them we grow here in our climate, because we can get a seven inch rain in July, which by all rights should kill everything there, but it doesn't. So it's really pretty amazing, and Ruscus, I know everybody's grown that in the plate. We know that does well, so it, it just, it's just quite a paradox. Any other? Yes. Is there any uh, any fallout or was your trip affected at all by the, the big Greek crisis, which I guess it occurred just before that in February and March? Well, the, the debt crisis not really affecting us <laughs> as much. Um, I thought Crete was amazingly vibrant. Now, I don't have anything to compare that to, obviously. And, you know, a little debt crisis is good for getting the hotels to come down in price. So the <laughs> debt crisis actually has two sides. What did really hurt us, that I didn't mention, is getting the plants back. So we flew them back with our friend to England. He got a phyto, got them on the plane, and that's when the big volcano went off up in oh. Greenland, Iceland, where the hell it was. So our plant sat there in the airport for 10 days, which is why we had much higher than normal losses. And the frustrating part is there's nobody you can scream at. Yeah. Because it's nobody's fault. It's just like the damn volcano. Every night I curse the TV. <laughs> so you know the plants are there. You pack them. You pack them for four days to get through all the inspection stuff. But you don't pack them for 14 days. You really can't. So that was very frustrating. We did have a higher loss rate than normal, but that's that's what you get on plant exploration. But a lot of the stuff is really doing well. Yeah. Did you see any Phoenix Theophrasty at the airport? At the airport. <laughs> that was the first thing we saw. We got off the plane to get there's the Phoenix. We'll see more of these. This is really great. Didn't see another one the entire time. Really? Yeah. And they're native to Crete. I know. They are native there. And that's what we thought for sure we'd find them. So that was really a shock. Yeah. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah, we were hoping to find some high elevation forms and get seed, but that was one of our target plants. But no, it was not to be found. Yeah. What's the pH like there? I did measure soil, but I would say probably pretty darn high. Because they generally, where you have low rainfall, you have high pHs. And there's just nothing to wash the, the acid, I mean, the, the alkaline out. So, yeah, it's, again, it doesn't make any sense because we're going from there, what are probably, I'm guessing, eight to eight and a half to our four, four and a half, and the stuff seems to do great. It just, it doesn't, if you use all the logical rules and the things you learn in school, they don't apply. Yeah. Is it, is that volcanic? Is it volcanic 
I believe it is. Yeah, I don't recall for sure. Does anybody remember? I, I did know all that. So the, if I seem to remember. Yeah. Okay. But it's just a big pile of rocks now. It's one, it's one serious pile. That's what I was going to ask you what the kind of rock it is. Is it limestone? It appeared to be lime. Yeah, limestone? Yeah, yeah, it appeared very limey and sort of felt limey. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah I, don't know what, I don't know what the basis is. A lot of them look white. Yeah, why. it is. Yeah, very, very white looking. But this soil was very sparse there. Yeah. Any others? Okay. Nope. Thank you. Thank you, Tony.